we are talking about confidence. And I'm really excited because I'm going to walk you through the five simple tools that help you build this as a skill. And tool number one, take action. This is obvious. I understand. We have the definition of confidence. Confidence is the willingness to try. You're not going to change your life or build confidence by thinking about the things you need to do. You must take action. And so the best action to take, the number one tool for helping you take action in those moments where you feel imposter syndrome or you feel nervous or you're embarrassed or you start to doubt yourself or you feel anxious, whatever the feeling is, forget the feeling. Screw the feeling. We got to take action in those moments because remember, we're building confidence. It's going to require you to try. Just use my five-second rule. I told you the whole story about how I created it, the science behind it in the episode we released way back in the day called Motivation is Garbage. I'll link to that. But if you're brand new to the podcast, let me give you the shortcut. When you're in a situation where you start to doubt yourself, you're just going to count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, and then you physically move within five seconds. So here's how you can use it. Heather's talking about the fact that she wants to build confidence in this new role where she's been promoted. There are things that she needs to do as a new leader, but she doesn't have the competency yet. Instead of thinking about those things, she can use the five second rule, five, four, three, two, one, to interrupt that self doubt which is right there in the interior part of your brain and your basal ganglia. It's a pattern to doubt yourself. And as you start counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one, your mind switches gears and your prefrontal cortex gets involved. And that's the part of the brain that controls your focus. It helps you interrupt thoughts and feelings of self-doubt. And it draws the part of your brain that will help you take action will help you engage in strategic thinking, will help you encode new behavior and habits. It will help you tap into your courage. That's it. That's all that it is for Alex, who is surrounded by all these high achievers. The next time she's sitting in a classroom and she has something that she wants to share, instead of shrinking in her seat, she's going to try. And the five second rule is going to help. Five, four, three, two, one. And then she's going to shoot that hand up in the air because you know what? Alex has something to say. And even though she doesn't feel comfortable, even though she might get a neck rash, even though her cheeks might go fire engine red, and even though she might stutter or stumble or have dry mouth or whatever might happen, five, four, three, two, one, she is willing to try. Because here's something I want you to understand. You can tap into courage before you start having that feeling of assuredness. Courage is what you tap into. Confidence is what you're building over time. I'm going to say that again. Courage comes first. Courage, five, four, three, two, one. You start counting backwards, man, that is an act of courage because you're going for it. Courage comes first. Confidence is what builds over time. How cool is that, right? I absolutely love this because what I'm ultimately teaching you And this, again, relates to all the research, is that there's two types of people out there. There are people who think about what they want to do, and then there are people that find the courage to take action. And that's what I want for you, because you're not going to think your way out of fear or doubt or insecurity. You're not going to think your way through your fears and anxiety. The fact is, you have greatness inside you, and I want you to start tapping into it. It's only through action that you unlock that power inside you and you become the person that you're meant to be. I mean, that's how I, that's how I've created the life that I have now. If I didn't learn how to five, four, three, two, one, push myself to try, I'd still be sleeping in a bed, staring at the ceiling, consumed with anxiety, feeling like I had ruined my life. That's how you change your life. You have to take action over and over and over again. And so I think you get this. You get that you're not going to change or build confidence by thinking about doing this. Five, four, three, two, one, stop thinking and start taking some risks. Start trying. Put a bet on yourself. Let's freaking go. Now let's do rule number two. Rule number two is if you personally just tremble in your boots when you think about doing the things that you'd love to do. Let's get back to you. Let's get selfish. What is it that more confidence 
would have you be doing differently. When you think about those things, speaking up at work, launching your business, tackling your health issues, putting your online dating profile up and getting yourself back out there because you're ready and you've healed and the heartbreak is over and you're ready to have some fun again. When you start thinking about how confidence would change your life, I guarantee you, you're still going to feel a little nervous. So here's a second tool that's going to help you try. You can use the power of objectivity, okay? Let's make it less personal. Be the person you want to become or create an alter ego. This can be fun, you know. We don't have to like white knuckle this this confidence thing. Let's have some fun with it because there's a study out of Johns Hopkins that I love and it's about letting go of self-doubt. And the study suggests that when you use an alter ego or you create a vision of the future you, the person you want to become, it gives you distance from the scaredy cat you who's never done this thing before. So ask yourself, you know who I, what I always ask myself? I go, well, what would The Rock do in this situation? I just love Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. I constantly use him as my avatar when it comes to confidence. What would The Rock do in this moment? And I always get an answer, and it feels less personal. Because you and I are friends, you can use The Rock, you can use me, what would Mel do if you're feeling unsure and you want to tap into the confidence that you kind of pick up on for me. And this also taps into an entire body of research that I talk about a lot on the Mel Robbins podcast, which is behavioral activation therapy. Decades of research show that when you start acting like the person you want to become in the future now in your present life, it's one of the fastest ways for you to change your mindset, for you to create new habits. Why? Because when you start acting like the person you want to become in the future, you start acting like that person today, what are you doing? You're trying. (laughs) You're trying to act like the future you would act. So let's go back to our first question, Heather. When she acts like the Heather two years from now, who's now gotten another promotion because she just slayed it in this role. The Heather today is trying to be the Heather she wants to become. Isn't that cool? Alex sitting in the classroom, surrounded by all these high achievers. When she acts like the Alex she wants to be two years from now, who's earned her doctorate, who is one of those high achievers, who is a bit more vocal, who is able to express her ideas, When she acts like that version of herself now, what is she doing? She's trying. How cool is this? It all just ladders right back to the research. That's why you can trust what I'm telling you. Another tool that you can use to build the skill of confidence is prepare. Because the more that you practice something, the more you're trying and the more competent you're going to be. So if you are nervous and you can't shake the nerves, Double down on preparing. That's right. Do rehearsals. Run through it. Why? Because every time you rehearse something, you're trying it. And it gives your mind and your nervous system the ability to lower the stress because your mind and your nervous system have prepared so you know what's coming. See, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice prepares you. And what's one other thing about practice? What's the first thing that you learned about confidence? Again, I come back to the definition. It's the willingness to try. That's how you put the definition into life, by practicing. Preparing for something, practicing something over and over and over, whether you're, you know, like uh, like the Williams sisters who literally stood there and hit balls 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 before they were even allowed to enter a tournament. What were they doing? They're building the skill of confidence. You want to be confident? Prove it by preparing. I use this all the time. You know, a lot of people, I laugh, like, you know, you you see me get in front of a a YouTube camera or you see me walk onto a stage or you listen to one of my audio books. You're like, how do you do that? I've prepared. (laughs) You know, because when you're ready, I mean, just think back in your own life. Think about those moments in high school or college where you weren't prepared for the test. How nervous were you? You were shaking in your boots. You couldn't even concentrate. You knew walking into the test that you were screwed. Now think about a moment when you actually studied, which is just you practicing. 
you feel calmer, more assured. Why? Because you were willing to try by sitting in the stacks in the library instead of going out and cracking open the books. And that's what I'm talking about. This is something you build. Let me tell you about tool number four. I love this. This is a mindset reframe because you got the five second rule. You've got the power of objectivity. What would Mel or The Rock do? You've got preparation. And now let me give you a mindset trick. I love this. I tell myself all the time why it's worth trying. The reason why I tell myself why it's worth trying, why is it worth trying something if I'm only going to fail? Why is it worth going for it if I can't make my dreams come true? I'll tell you why. Because everything that you do in life is preparing you for something that hasn't happened yet. What did I tell you about confidence? Confidence is not something you build when you're winning. I think oftentimes when we're winning, what gets built is arrogance and bravado. And we forget what went into winning at something in the first place. True confidence, the skill of confidence, it's forged in fire. I mean, I've failed more times than I have time to tell you. You guys know that a decade ago, talk about failure, 800 grand in debt, unemployed, drinking my way through my problems, and all of that heartbreak and headache and breakdown in my life, which was horrendous to go through, it led me to the five-second rule. If there was no debt, there was no drinking, there was no heartache, there would be no five-second rule. When I was a talk show host, I, here I was taping a talk show at CBS Broadcast Center here in New York City. It was a dream of mine to be able to have a daytime talk show. It gets canceled. It was leading me somewhere. Where? To this podcast, which is my most favorite thing that I've ever done in my career. See, I choose not to stay in a place of self-doubt. I choose not to wallow in failure because I know that life is always preparing you for something. And I know that your greatest failures, your biggest heartbreaks, they always teach you the most important lessons in life. You know, and, and I keep getting questions from you guys. Mel, oh my God, you're so confident. Like what? You're 54 years old. You keep reinventing yourself. You keep trying new things like this podcast. What is it inside you, Mel? What is it inside me that makes me take all these risks, that makes me constantly try new things, that makes me willing to fail, to do something embarrassing or even disastrous? I'll tell you what it is. I want to get as much out of this life as I possibly can. And if you look at the math, I'm halfway through it. And it scares me to think that I could be on my deathbed and look back on my life and say, I wish I had tried that. I wish I had had the confidence to try that. I do not want to die and have regrets. And so while I'm here, while I'm breathing, while I'm able to, I am going to follow my curiosity. I am going to follow my heart. I am going to try new things. I am going to do absolutely everything that I can do to grow, to feel, to learn. And that's going to require me to take risks. That's going to require me to fuck up things. That's going to require me to look stupid. And I'm willing to do that because I know on the other side of the biggest heartbreaks of your life are the most amazing, heart-filled moments. I know that in the middle of every failure that I experience, and boy, I experience them oftentimes of my own doing, every single failure has, honest to God, equipped me with the lessons and the skill or the wisdom that I needed to be able to do something even cooler down the line. And I can prove it to you. Just, just look back on one of the scariest moments of your life, one of the biggest things that you just blew. I bet you can tell me that that horrible thing that happened, that really hard thing that in the moment you were like, why is this happening to me? That right now, no matter what your life looks like, you can sit here and you know exactly what you learned from it. You know that you would not be the person you are today 
had it not been for that thing that you experienced, that you survived, that you learned from. And so what drives me is just wanting to experience as much as I can from this one life that I have. And it's not all going to be a joyride. And so I'm willing to take the risk. I'm willing to try. I'm willing to look stupid. And I'm willing to do it because I think the payoff that you get, it's worth it. It's so worth it. So this moment, it's preparing me for something that hasn't happened yet. And that free that reframe, what it does is it helps me put failure and heartbreak and all the hard shit in life into a box that is something that stays by my side as I move forward instead of a wall or a block or an obstacle that stops me from continuing to move forward because that's how you move forward. You continue to try. And the final tool when it comes to building the skill of confidence is you have to focus on you because nobody's coming. Like nobody's going to try for you. Nobody is going to be there to motivate you to try. Nobody's going to be there to give you the pep talk. I'm here twice a week. I, I, it really is my mission that these episodes and our relationship through this podcast is one where you feel empowered and encouraged and you're reminded of who you are, that this is like a little reset, a pep talk, that you get the tools and the encouragement and the high five that you need. But ultimately, it's up to you. And you got to learn how to stop looking at the world around you and what everybody and their mother is doing. And you got to look right back in the mirror because you are the one person that you're going to spend your whole life with. And it's time that you start to focus on that person and getting into a better relationship with that person called you. And today we've got a crazy cool topic. We are talking about mindset. And before we jump into the science and the cool tactics that you're going to be able to apply to your life to change your mindset, I want to just remind you that this episode is part of a month-long series that we are doing here on the Mel Robbins podcast about the building blocks and the research that you need to know in order to create a better life. Here's the simple truth about your mindset. Your mind is either working for you or against you. That's what it's doing. And so by the end of today's episode, there's going to be a couple things that go down. First of all, you are going to understand that you have the power to reprogram your mind. That's right. You can take simple steps and you can practice them every day to train your mind to work for you. And I'm also going to prove to you today, using very simple science, that your mind is trying to help you. It doesn't know any better if it's working against you. And when you can identify the way that you want to feel or what you want to do with your life, you can change your mindset to help you. And when you do that, here's what's super cool. It improves the day-to-day -day experience of your life, and it changes what it's like to be in your head. So whether you're listening to this episode because you struggle right now with overthinking or feeling unworthy, or maybe you have a really positive outlook, but you just want to level up. You want to play a bigger game. That's where I am right now. I am so ready to take a bigger swing to knock it out of the park this year. And the mindset and creating a more powerful mindset, that is a tool in your arsenal to help you achieve anything that you want. So today, you and I are going to get serious about making your mind work for you. And I want to start us off with a question from a listener named Brandy. Hi there, Mel. My name is Brandy. How do I stop the spiral of negative thoughts and feelings? I really want to reset and start embracing a happier life. I just don't know where to start. I hope you can help. Brandy, I am so happy that you asked this question because we have received thousands of versions of this question. And I'm also kind of thrilled. I picked your question in particular because you use the word reset. And today I am going to teach you how to give yourself a mindset reset. And I'm going to explain what a mindset reset is, the simple, step, the simple steps to doing it. It's all going to make sense in a couple minutes. But I want to give you a preview so that as we step into the process of giving yourself a reset mentally, that you have a baseline understanding. So here's a preview of what we're going to talk about, okay? You have a filter in your brain 
and I'm going to teach you using science and neuroscience how to use this filter that's already in your brain to your advantage. And everything that I'm going to teach you, you can put to practice immediately. And what I love so much about this conversation that we're about to have is that you may even experience an immediate change the first time you try this little thing I'm going to teach you. This is so cool because the moment you experience this small change in your mindset, it will create momentum. It creates excitement. It creates possibility. There's this opening of a whole new way of thinking. But before we can get there, I want to just start with the basics so that you feel really empowered around the topic of mindset and around reprogramming this filter in your brain. So let's just start with a definition so we're all using the same terminology. And let's define, you and I, what is a mindset? Well, your mindset is your beliefs and your opinions about the way that the world works. That's the definition when you look it up. However, you know that I prefer metaphors. Mel Robbins is dyslexic, so she likes to be able to visualize something, especially when we're talking about this intellectual stuff, okay? So the metaphor that I love when it comes to mindset and the sciencey, psychological, neurological aspect of mindset and brain programming is I use the metaphor sunglasses. I think about your mindset like a pair of sunglasses. So stop and think right now about your favorite pair of sunglasses. I have these sunglasses that I have had for almost 15 years. I bought them because we were going on this rafting trip and I had forgot to pack my sunglasses. And so I bought the only cool pair of sunglasses that they had on that turnstile thing on the counter. They were like 15 bucks. And they were these huge black bug-eyed glasses. I feel like Jackie O when I wear them. So think about your favorite pair of sunglasses for just a minute. Now I want you to think about the lens color. And think about how when you put on that pair of sunglasses, that lens on your favorite sunglasses, it colors and filters what you see and it gives it a tint, right? I mean, if you put on rose-colored sunglasses, the world has a rosy, bright tint to it. If you put on amber sunglasses, same thing. Gray, same thing. My big, black, bug-eyed glasses that I just love. I feel so glamorous in these $15 plastic things. Everything looks crazy dark just really blocks everything out. Your mindset works the same way as a pair of sunglasses. Let's go back to the written definition of your mindset. Your mindset is made up of your beliefs and your opinions. And just like the lens on a pair of sunglasses, those beliefs and opinions that you have, they create a mindset through which you filter the world. And I'm going to give you a couple examples. Let's say you're a pessimistic person. If that's your mindset, if that's your outlook, you will filter the world through pessimism, just like a dark pair of sunglasses skews the outside world with this black and darker shade. And if you're not pessimistic, let's just think about the most pessimistic person you know, someone who is always negative. They could be sitting on the beach in the Bahamas with a beautiful, fabulous tropical drink in their hands. Sun is shining crystal clear ocean, and they're annoyed because lunch hasn't come out yet. You know that kind of person. You've sat next to them at a wedding where the band is awesome, the couple is so cute and happy, families together. And what is this person doing? They're bitching about something, some relative that's sitting all the way on the other side of the room. All they notice is the one thing that's wrong or irritating them. They don't even notice all of the amazing things that are going on around them. Isn't it interesting when I describe this negative, pessimistic person? You know exactly who I'm talking about. And you're probably thinking, dear God, do not sit them next to me at the next family wedding. I do not want to hear this, okay? I do not like that kind of mindset or that mood. I do not want dark colored glasses skewing the way that I enjoy this situation right now. And here's the craziest thing about mindset. You know that pessimistic person you and I were just thinking about? They have no idea that they have dark glasses on. This is just the way they see the world. I'm going to give you another example of mindset and how important this is. I want you to think about someone you work with, or maybe you go to school with this person, who has a can-do attitude. No matter how tight the deadline or how rude 
the customer is that you guys are waiting on or how much other team members are slacking off, this one person with a can-do attitude, they always see the bright side or they have this unbelievable ability to just shrug off the rudeness of other people or the laziness of the students that are on your group project. And they literally can just flip it and turn to you and go, "Ah, well, you know, they probably have something going on in their personal life. It's as if they always see any situation or any relationship from the positive. They see possibility. They give people the benefit of the doubt. They assume good intent. This too is a mindset. It's just like putting on a rosy pair of sunglasses. Everything is sharper, clearer, brighter when you have this kind of mindset. Even a cloudy, crappy day looks like a beautiful sunrise. In fact, there's a really cool study from the University of Toronto about rose-colored glasses. This isn't just a saying. When you wear rose-colored glasses, your attitude is better. And there's even more based on this research. When you wear rose-colored glasses, you even see more. Your visual horizon is expanded because these rose-colored glasses put you in a good mood. Your mindset determines the way you view the world, and that determines how you think. So I want to do a gut check right now with you. If you had to tell the truth, or actually, let's make this really accurate. If your best friend had to describe the color of the sunglasses that you wear, Would they say that you're more on the lane of the dark, bug-eyed, plastic glasses that just skewed everything like it was midnight? Or are you more on the range of everything's rosy? You're always positive. You are always upbeat. You see beauty where most people see nothing. Do a quick gut check with yourself because your mindset is critical. It shapes the way you view the world. And that determines how and what you think about. It also determines how you feel about the present moment, about your past and about the future. And most importantly, this is where it gets really important. Your mindset determines what actions you take and what actions you don't take. And it also impacts how you see other people. So for example, if I asked you, so what's your mom like? Before you even answer the question, you subconsciously drop on sunglasses and it filters your opinion about her. And by having a filter about another person, it also limits what's possible for her. You think she just is that way, which means there's no room for her to change. So why is mindset and getting intentional about changing your mindset? Why is this so important? Why do you need to know what color the lens is that you view the world through? And more importantly, why it's time to pop those lenses out if they don't serve you and put in different lenses so that you can see things differently. I'll tell you why your mindset is so important. Because so much of your potential is either limited or expanded by your mindset. I prove to you almost every single episode on the Mel Robbins podcast that with the right attitude and consistent action, you can absolutely change anything about your life or your health or your relationships for the better. And if you're walking around right now with a really negative mindset, you've got those dark bug-eyed glasses on, and you're sitting there every single day telling yourself day in and day out that there is nothing that you can do about this situation, this job, this relationship, this health condition that you've tried, that you've failed, that you don't deserve it, that you don't know how. I want you to consider that your own mindset is keeping you stuck in that broken situation because your mindset is not inspiring you to do anything about it. Being able to spot those dark lenses, pop them out, put in something brighter, rosier, more luminous, it's going to change everything. And here's why. When you feel more hopeful or when you see options and you start to tell yourself, well, why not? Why don't I just try it? What if it works out? Why don't I just see what happens? I do deserve to be happier. I don't deserve to be treated like this. I should start speaking up. That rosier mindset It inspires you to take the actions that change your life. And it's the actions that matter. 
this is why I love this topic about mindset and what you're about to learn about the filter in your brain so much. Because right now, there are areas in your life where your own mindset is blocking you from taking action. And before we jump into the filter in your brain and changing your mindset, I want to be very clear about something. This conversation today, it's not about positive thinking. You and I are talking about training your mind to work for you. That's very different. This is not toxic positivity. I'm not asking you to put a positive spin on a shitty situation. I'm also very clear that thinking nice thoughts, it's not going to get your bills paid. However, if you can get serious and intentional and strategic about training your mind to have a rosier and more optimistic and empowered attitude, you, my friend, will be able to say to yourself, I can do this. You will be able to say, you know what? I know my student debt is piled from the floor to the ceiling and I have not opened those bills in approximately 10 months, but I believe in my ability to figure out how to pay this off. If you can, that is an example of how you go from I'm fucked to I can figure this out. When you take off the dark glasses, you know what you'll see? You'll see you're not stuck in the job. You're not stuck in the relationship. You're not stuck with the unhealthy habits that you have. If you're the kind of person that constantly shrugs your shoulders and is like, well, it is what it is. Got this college debt. It is what it is. I always date these losers. It is what it is. My grandfather was heavy. My mother was heavy. I guess I'll just be heavy and feel really bad. About it. No, no. You can look at something differently. And when you look at it differently, you see different options. And I also want to say one more thing before we jump into the filter in your brain and its connection to your mindset. There are things in life that you are not going to change, or at least you're not going to change them overnight. For example, you and I cannot change that there is discrimination in this world. There is bias and there is violence that a lot of people experience. We cannot change the fact that poverty and mental health issues impact people for real. But here's what you can do. You can train yourself to look at the future and decide how you're going to react to and respond to the, the things that you're facing in your life. You can decide how you're going to heal and what you're going to do about those things for yourself and your community. And one final thing, we have a huge global audience here at the Mel Robbins podcast. And I want you to know if you're listening in another country that I am reading all of the questions that you're submitting through the DMs and through the forums at melrobbins.com. And I see so many of you writing about your desire to create a better life and the fact that it's hard because you're living in Iran or your country is under siege like Ukraine. And I'm going to tell you something. A positive mindset is not going to change the reality of what is going on around you. Here's what it does, and this is why it's important. It empowers you to face it, to deal with it, and to survive it. That's what a mindset does. And that's why it's important to get serious about training your mind to work for you. And this connection between mindset and action this is so important that I want to give you one more example about how your mindset either inspires action or it discourages it. So let's just say that you are in a job and you hate it. You feel stuck. You feel like you're kind of dead inside. You're not excited about anything. It's day in, day out, the same thing. Or if you're not working right now, and let's say you've taken time off to raise your kids, and you're sitting there going, I want to get back in the workforce, but I don't have any skills, and I've got a 20-year hold in my resume. If your mindset is like those dark, bug-eyed sunglasses that just muddy everything that you see, this is what you're telling yourself. Nobody's going to hire me. I don't have any experience. I don't even know how to write a resume. How the hell am I going to get into interior design when I went to college for accounting and I work in a big accounting firm and I don't even know how to begin doing this? I can't make this happen. If that is the way that you look at the future, if that's your mindset, if you color what's possible through that dark lens, if you keep telling yourself those things, 
you will see a world where you can't change. So are you going to feel inspired to work on your resume? Of course not. Are you going to feel empowered to start Googling and, and researching and figuring out how to go from an accounting job into interior design? No, because your mindset has stopped you before you even started. And that's why it's critical for you to realize this is not just a conversation about your thoughts. At the end of the day, if you don't have a positive mindset, you and I can talk about actions and habits all day long till we're blue in the face, but you won't do shit about it. I got to get you to have the kind of mindset that also says, hey, it's worth it. Hey, I can do something about this. Because if I can get you to be more optimistic, if I can get you to take the dark lens off and put on a lighter one, if I can get you to start believing, it is worth it for you to apply. It is worth it for you to put your dating app back up. Yeah, it is worth it for you to pick up the pen and start working on that book you've always wanted to write. Hell yes, it's worth it for you to take 10 minutes today and lay down on the floor and do those stretching exercises that the doctor told you should do because you threw your back out instead of sitting on the couch and bitching about it. Of course it's worth it. If I can get you to start to flip from, ugh, easy for you to say, Mel, works out for you, doesn't work out for me, it's not going to help. I've had anxiety for years. If I can get you into, hey, maybe it will work. Hey, maybe I'm ready. Maybe I should try this. Maybe I do deserve this. That singular switch in your mindset motivates you, encourages you to take action. And that's critical. Because without action, your problems are not going away. Without action, those dreams are not coming through. Without action, you are not healing the crap that's giving you pain. When you change your mindset, it doesn't make those challenges disappear. It changes your ability to face them. And so I'm going to teach you and I'm going to teach Brandy. Remember that question? She wants, how do I reset this, Mel? How do I stop doubting myself? Well, I'm going to teach you how to do a mindset reset. Because the fact is, you can change your mindset. You are not stuck with the thoughts that you think. You are not stuck with the way that you feel. You can make your mind a place that supports you. Yes, you can start to see possibility where you never saw any possibility or hope before. One of the things that I want to really focus on next because Jay unpacks the four phases of attraction, dreams, struggle, and trust mm. in the book is I think my favorite rule, honestly, of all eight is number four. Your partner is your guru. I thought it would be. When you said your favorite rule, I was thinking it would be this Why one. did you think that? It would I don't be. know. I just feel like you, obviously you and Chris have such an incredible hard work based like genuine real relationship and marriage and it's like I think as you spend more time together you start learning so much more through your partner and from your partner and I don't know I just felt it it was intuitive I was just like Mel yeah I can see Mel being Chris's guru and I can see Chris being Mel's guru will you explain what that means because I think when you yeah. first hear your partner is your guru I didn't realize what it meant because yeah. it didn't mean what I thought it meant. Yeah. And I want to encourage people to understand that this step comes as you deepen a relationship. Mm -hmm. This isn't something you want on day one. Like if anyone's listening to that rule and you don't read the book and you're thinking, oh yeah, my partner's my business mentor or they're my coach or they're my therapist. Like that's not what I'm talking about right. at all. What I'm saying is that as you deepen your friendship, as you deepen your relationship, as you actually get to know each other better, your partner becomes the one person who exposes all your flaws, all your weaknesses, and all your truths to you without even trying. And I'll give a personal example of this. When I first met Radhi, I didn't have anything. I didn't have a job. I was in $25,000 worth of debt. I didn't have any job offers or prospects. And I was being rejected by 40 different companies during the time we were dating. And so I would tutor economics and subjects that I was great at, at college and university to students, save up to pay for our dates. And I always felt intimidated that we'd go out on dates and I'd be with her friends or family and they'd be like, well, well Jay, what are you doing? What are you up to? And I really had no answer because I'd just come out of being a monk and surprise, surprise, no one wants to hire a former monk. 
And then it was really interesting because as my career took off, and I've been with Radhi obviously for, since before, and then as my career took off, I started to hit these external milestones. Yep. And I'd hold them up almost, not physically, but not physically, but mentally. I would hold them up and I'd be like, Radhi, love me for this. Look what I just achieved. I did this. Love me for this. And she wouldn't love me more for that. And so then I achieved something bigger and I'd be like, but look at this. Look what I did. Look what I did for us. Look how amazing I am. Like, love me for this. And she didn't react differently. And so then I kept going and then I held it up. And it was at that point I realized there's only two truths. Either my wife doesn't love me, <laughs> which I know wasn't true because she'd right. shown me love in so many ways. Right. Or that there was something I was missing. And so what I realized was I was trying to get my wife to love me for what I achieved when she actually loved me for who I am. Mm. She didn't teach me that by getting out a whiteboard and drawing bullet points. She taught me that by loving me only for my essence and who I was. So every time she would acknowledge me or appreciate me, it was not about the views or the downloads or the, the amount of people that were commenting. It was ne that was never the stuff she congratulated. The thing she congratulated was, I really love what I learned from you in that moment today. Hmm. Or I really loved how you dealt with that challenge. Or I saw that you were being criticized for this and I saw how you responded. That's what I love about you. So just in the way she loved me, she was teaching me how to love myself. And I think that your partner is the only person who can do that for you because they know you so intimately. But the interesting thing is, a guru in the way I learned from a guru and ashram in the way I studied, gurus don't judge. They don't critique. They're compassionate and empathetic. They don't complain and compare to show you your flaws. They reflect the truth back to you just by being present with you so that you can see yourself. And so a guru isn't a partner who's telling you what to do or manipulating and controlling you because that's ownership. That's not a relationship. And ooh, I think people- ooh, Hold on. Hold on, everybody. <laughs> there was another one. <laughs> The monk is in the house dropping the wisdom. I love making you laugh. <laughs> oh, gosh. You make but, me laugh so much. But yeah. you just said that when somebody's controlling you and when somebody is, I would even add in nitpicking, criticizing, yeah. manipulating, judging, uh, being cold with you, silent mm. treatment, that's ownership. Yes. Will you talk more about that? Because yeah. I think there's a lot of people listening to you right now going, your, your marriage sounds amazing. Yeah. And my relationship sucks. Yeah. Because I do not have a partner uh, that is like that. I have a partner that's criticizing me. I have a partner that is doing all those things that make me feel bad. Yeah. So talk to that person yeah. and yeah. this notion of partnership versus ownership. Yeah, absolutely. And so we come into relationships based on the imprints that our parents gave us, as we talked about before, or even our first partners gave us. Mm. And we also have so much inside of us that's unresolved that that comes out in four ways. And these four things are comparison, criticism, complaining, and control. We think that if we do these four things, we feel better about ourselves, our partner may change, and overall, this is the language we've learned in how to talk to anyone. Right. And so what we do is we compare them to someone else thinking that if they know what one of our friends did for their anniversary, then our partner will get their act together. Yeah. No one in the history of comparison has ever changed their life because they were compared to someone else. It's true. You don't make someone act better by making them feel inferior. It doesn't work that way. People act better because they feel inspired to, they feel called to, they feel energized in their life, but we try and use comparison. If someone else is trying to control you, it can often come in the form of care. It can look like care, but it's actually control, and there's only one way to know. Is someone giving you care in the way you want to better you, or are they doing it to make you more comfortable and convenient for them? Are they 
telling you what to wear? Are they telling you which of your friends are a good influence on oh. you? When you hear that, you think, oh, they might actually care about me. They might actually care about me because they're telling me these friends are a bad influence. These friends are a good influence. But wait a minute, I've never actually told them what I even do with these friends. I've never even told them. And by the way, I did some of this when I met Radhi. When I met Radhi, I would look at some of her friends and I'd think, well, I don't think they're a good influence on her. And even if it came from a place of care, I realized that wasn't my position. Some of these friends had been in her life far longer than I'd been in her life. Wow. That, that whole paradigm of ownership versus partnership. Mm -hmm. Like, I hope that's a ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Is somebody controlling you and trying to change you and own what you're doing? Or are they truly in partnership supporting you with your goals yeah. and hearing you? And it applies the other way too, Mel. I think a lot of us who are in personal growth, who are in self-development, we have a bad habit of wanting to improve our partners, but not in the way they want, in the way we want. The amount of people that come to me and say, Jay, I'm like really begging my partner to read your book. And I'm like, please don't. <laughs> like, please don't. I mean it because I want you to actually stay together. And maybe what they need to do is they need to watch one of my interviews with an athlete they love. Maybe that's what they need to. Maybe right. they don't even need to learn from me. Maybe they need to learn from a completely different person in maybe it's one of our friends. Maybe it's someone else. Maybe it's someone from decades ago. The, the point is, are you trying to get them to the next step in their journey? Or are you trying to get them to the next step in your journey? Oh, okay. Hold on, everybody. Did you just hear that? Because that is literally... Just make me laugh. That's it. No, yeah. but so, like, yeah. I, I, I really like to stop. Yeah, yeah, no, it's beautiful. You do it so well. I just want so well. everybody listening to get the wisdom that you are weaving together because I think that's it right there. Are you trying to get them to step forward? You said it better. Something yeah. about, I like, saying, I was saying, are you trying to get them to the next step in their journey or are you trying to get them to the next step in your journey? So you may love listening to me and Mel, and that's beautiful, and I love that. And if your partner loves listening to me and Mel too, awesome. But chances are they might like learning from a different voice and a different coach and a different teacher and a different guide. And guess what? That's okay. Because what inspires them may be completely different. I've had clients before where I'm working with the wife, or I'm working with the husband, and they want me to work with each other. And I'll say, if they want to, if that person wants to learn from me, I'm all for it. But we have to allow people to select their own mentors. We have to allow people to select their own path. And by the way, I'll give an example. There's, there's a, a couple that I know, and one of them finds knowledge and learning to be what growth means to them. Mm -hmm. And one of them finds service. Mm. So one of them will happily go to a soup kitchen, a homeless shelter, and help out every week. And to them, that's growth. And to the other person, reading books. Listening to podcasts, trying to study and be better is, is their form of growth. Now, could we honestly say one is better than the other? No, it's just two different paths and probably they'll cross at one point if we don't push the other person away. But sometimes we push away the other person so far that our parts of growth never get to come together. Yes, and I think you also have to be present enough to know when someone that you quote love is pushing you off your path mm -hmm. that you're busy supporting them on theirs mm. but they are not meeting you yeah. halfway okay i know what you're probably thinking as you digest this whole story how the hell does something so simple work mel i mean come on for real five four three two one well let me get you into action okay because when you try this thing you're going to experience the change yourself one of the reasons why this is so powerful is because your brain has one job, and that is to keep you alive, which means your brain will resist any kind of new change you want to make. And the thing I'm going to have you do is going to make you feel this resistance. And it's important for you to realize that this is part of your wiring. You're never going to not have to push yourself to do things when you don't feel like it. Like this is just a fact of life. In fact, one of the hardest things for us all to do is to start something new. And there's a scientific reason why. The reason why is because 
pushing yourself to do something, whether it's pushing yourself to get to the gym or pushing yourself to change a habit or pushing yourself to stay sober or pushing yourself to speak up more or pushing yourself to express your boundaries, right? Or make the cold calls that are going to make you more money. All of that requires you to go from doing one thing like scrolling on your phone or sitting on the couch to doing something different. You have to summon something called activation energy. You have to activate the movement inside of you. One of the coolest things about why the five second rule works is the counting itself is an action. So it's almost like the little Trojan horse. So you're sitting there on the couch. You know you need to go for a run, but it's raining and it's cold and you don't feel like it. You blew it off this morning. You've already made yourself wrong. It's now three o'clock in the afternoon. You can think of a million things that you would rather do than going for a run. You now know the secret. The secret is motivation is garbage. No one's coming to push your ass off that couch. This is up to you. The second you're sitting there marinating in your excuses and your sad sack, whatever, feeling low energy. I get it. I'm there every day at three o'clock right there with you, not feeling like it. The second you start counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one, you've made the decision to get off that couch and go exercise, even though you don't feel like it. The second you hit one, get up off the couch. Start walking toward your closet. Change into your running shoes, change into your tights, whatever. And five, four, three, two, one, walk out the door. That is how you summon the activation energy to start. And starting's the hardest part, right? So that's why this works. In addition to the physiology, in addition to the brain science, in addition to everything else, from a real common sense point of view, you are starting with the counting. And so I want to leave you in motion. I don't want you to just learn about this thing because it doesn't work if you think about it. You got to use the tool. And once you use it, you're going to be able to teach it to anybody in your life that's struggling because they're waiting to feel motivated. You can give it to anybody once you try it. And so what's the best way to get you moving? I want you to do a five-day wake up challenge with me. Okay. I know you're already groaning. I can literally hear it through my earphones over there. I don't want to wake up. Good. Okay. And for those of you that can just spring out of bed, first of all, you're a weirdo. And the way that we're going to make this uh, work for you is set your alarm. If you're the kind of person that just, oh, I just naturally wake up. Oh, I just spring out of bed. You're going to uh, set your alarm 30 minutes earlier because I want to manufacture the resistance that you are going to push through with the five second rule. For the rest of us who just hate getting out of bed, here's what you're gonna do. Tonight, set your alarm, okay? Tomorrow morning, when the alarm goes off, you're immediately going to feel yourself thinking about getting out of bed. You're immediately going to want to stay in bed. We all do. I mean, who wants to get out of bed? It's cozy, it's warm, it's yummy in there, you know? Especially if you're sleeping with your loved one or your fur babies, okay? I get it. That is me every single morning. When that alarm goes off, you're going to notice this moment of hesitation because you're not going to want to use the five-second rule. Good. That's that resistance. That's the fact that uh, activation energy is now required. That's your brain going, but I don't want to change. And then you're going to count five, four, three, two, one, throw those sheets off, stand up. You're going to hate this. Start walking towards the bathroom. By the time you get to the bathroom, you're good. So that's what you're going to do for five mornings in a row. Alarm goes off. Count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. The second you hit one, the sheets are off and you stand up and start walking toward the bathroom. You're going to hate it. You're not going to feel like doing it. If you can push through the resistance that you feel every morning about getting up when the alarm rings, you can push through the resistance everywhere in your life. You are building a muscle, 
a muscle of courage, of confidence, of action. You are building the skill of being able to take action when you don't feel like it. And that skill will pay you dividends for the rest of your life. Now, I'd like to support you in this wake up challenge and let me support you. And here's how you can let me support you. Go to melrobbins.com slash wake up. W-A-K-E-U-P. One word, wake up. I don't think it's one word in real life or maybe it is, but on the website, it's melrobbins.com slash wake up. If you, uh, the instructions for the wake up challenge will be there in case you want to share them with somebody else. And more importantly, if you share your email with me, don't worry, I'm not going to put you in some like, you know, I'm not going to sell your name to anybody. I just want to support you. I will send you a really fun, encouraging email every single day that you're in this challenge for five days, because I really want you to try this. And I want you to try this because, you know, the five second rule, I'm so passionate about it, not because of my experience. I'm passionate about it because of the experience of millions of people around the world who have used the five second rule first to get out of bed and then to go on to make amazing, courageous, incredible changes in their life. And the same is going to be true for you. But it's only true if you're willing to push yourself. And here's the interesting thing about this challenge. Notice you don't feel like doing the wake-up challenge. What, are you waiting to feel motivated to do it? I mean, isn't that the whole point of what we've been talking about? In order to get what you want, you got to push yourself to act before you're ready, before you feel like it. I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen? That you try it for five days and then you go back to hitting the snooze button? I think something incredible will happen when you place a bet on yourself, when you allow me to support you by sending you these emails. I believe that if you were to practice pushing through the resistance five mornings in a row, and it sounds simple, it is not easy. I think you would be surprised by how good you feel about yourself and the ripple effect that it creates in your life. That's what I believe is going to happen. And I can't wait to support you in it. You are one decision away from a different life, a better life. And yes, it's not going to change overnight. It changes through those decisions that you're making that add up over time. I hope you find the courage to make the decision that's going to change your life today. I'm asking you to 54321, sign up for that wake up challenge, melrobbins.com slash wake up and let me support you. When you start making courageous decisions, when you start pushing yourself forward, when you start going for bigger things, when you stop thinking and you start doing, are you going to fail? Probably. Will you mess up? I sure do. That's okay. I want you to just keep waking up every single morning, five, four, three, two, one, and show up for yourself again. Because it's what you do after you fail. It's what you do in those moments when you don't feel like it. It's those moments when you push yourself that matters most. Do not waste another day of your life waiting, wishing, or hoping motivation comes. All the things you desire are right in front of you. They're waiting for you, waiting for you to push through all of that resistance and self-doubt and walk toward what you want. No matter how old you are or what's happened in your life, you can achieve the life you want. I'm sorry, you don't have to believe it. I've got enough confidence in this fact to believe for you until you catch up. I have way too much evidence having seen the lives of millions of people change through these small decisions to know that, yes, you can change your life too. You have dreams to fulfill. You've got a world to change. You've got a life to live. So I want you to get your butt out there and 54321, go do it. I will see you in the Wake Up Challenge. I will see you in the next episode. And I am so excited to be kicking off this whole new chapter of my life with you. Thank you for being here. And more importantly, 
Thank you for trying this because thinking about this tool is not going to change your life. Motivation is garbage. No one's coming, but you got everything inside you that you need. So five, four, three, two, one, go do it. And we're about to jump into three myths related to confidence with a question from a listener named Alex. Hey, Mel, it's Alex here. Can you talk about how to thrive around high achievers when you're not naturally an extrovert or someone with great confidence? I'm trying to succeed at university, and this is something I find super challenging. Alex, great question. And this allows us to talk about myth number one about confidence. And that myth is that confident people are the loudest and most extroverted in the room. So first things first, Alex, stop beating yourself up because you're a little bit more introverted. And what I can tell based on your question is that you do want to be more visible. You do want to have a breakthrough in the skill of confidence because you do want to be somebody that's contributing your ideas. And so I want to tell you the truth about confident people. Confident people are very often the quiet people in the room because there's a huge difference between confidence and bravado. You know, they're not the same thing. Confidence has nothing to do with swagger. It has nothing to do with how much you talk or blab on and on in class. If you're truly confident, you've built that skill, you don't have to prove anything to anybody because you know that confidence is simply being willing to try. It's not about being extroverted or introverted because confidence is not a personality trait. Confidence is a skill that you can build. And so I want you to also be honest with yourself. Go back to being selfish in this episode because you're talking about, quote, these high achievers and you're not naturally an extrovert. If you're selfish, Alex, how would the skill of confidence change the way you're showing up? Because if you answer my question to you with the answer, oh, I would talk more in class. Oh, I would advocate more for my ideas. Oh, I would raise my hand and I would put my, my name in the ring for certain opportunities before, you know, stopping myself and thinking about it. If you can answer that question, how the skill of confidence would change the way you're showing up, great. Then use the definition of confidence now to push yourself to try those things that you believe that more confidence would be having you do because that's how you're going to build competency in those things you're not doing now. Let me tell you the second myth about confidence. See, a lot of people believe that confidence is built when you're winning. Not true. Not true. The truth is that confidence is like steel. It's forged in the fire of your life. You don't create the skill of confidence when life is easy. Confidence that reserve, that skill that you build, it's created in the moments that are hard. Confidence requires you to try. It requires you to feel like an imposter. It requires you to start at zero. It requires you to do things that you've never done before. And if you're naturally more introverted, sometimes speaking in class can be as scary as jumping out of an airplane, you know, and going skydiving. But that's okay because you can try and you can fail, and your cheeks can turn bright red, and you can say something that doesn't sound that like PhD sounding, and you know what? You're not going to die. It's going to be okay because you're willing to try and learn, and that's what's at the heart of this skill. It's not judgment. It's curiosity. It's leaning forward. It's trying. It's action. And here's the third myth about confidence, and that is, you know, I often hear people say, I lost my confidence. Mm, nope. Nope, you didn't. The truth is you cannot lose confidence. See, you're just blocked from the feeling of it because you stopped trying, which is the source of it. So let me give you an example. If you sit there and say, you know, oh, I must have lost some confidence along the way because now I'm around all these great achievers and they're always talking in class and I feel like a complete idiot, blah, 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 blah. No. No, you haven't lost anything because what's the definition of confidence? Confidence is the willingness to try. 
and you're in a chapter of your life where life is testing you. If you're around all these high achievers, it's because you belong there and it's because you're meant to grow. And that resistance and pressure that you feel internally, do not aim that at yourself as if something's wrong with you. There's no difference between the high achievers and you, Alex. The only difference is your willingness to try something that's a little scary, to show up, to be seen, to share your ideas. You know, there's this TED Talk that I absolutely love called Who Are You Really? And it's by Dr. Brian Little. He's a professor over in the UK. And the entire 20-minute talk is all about the fact that he's profoundly introverted in his life. But because teaching matters to him, he has taught himself how to be profoundly extroverted when he's teaching a class. Now, it's wildly draining for him because he's an introvert, but I'm trying to tell you, you're not in a fixed place. And confidence is a skill you can build if you're willing to try. And I can tell you are because it matters to you. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.